Hey guys, welcome back to the third part in a four-part lecture series over the heart. My name is Matthew Belzer and today we're going to be covering excitation contraction coupling and we're really going to draw a focus to the mechanical events of the heart. So without further ado, what I would do to get kind of going today is I'd have your lecture handout out and available to you so you can take notes and answer questions as we go through. You can pause and really think about what's going on at each different segment. And how I like to start off every lecture, essentially, when we're talking about the heart, is just talking about the flow of blood through the heart. Because understanding the flow of blood through the heart helps to connect a lot of the things that we're talking about in every lecture, whether it be over the electrical activity of the heart, the conduction pathways of the heart, the mechanical activity and excitation contraction coupling, which we're going over today. So if we start at the right-hand side of the heart, we have exchange at the level of systemic capillaries, meaning capillaries all throughout your body. Oxygen and nutrients are delivered to tissues. Carbon dioxide is picked up. That O2 poor, right, we call it deoxygenated or O2 poor carbon dioxide rich blood, then returns back to the right side of the heart via the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and technically the coronary sinus, and all that O2 poor blood enters into the right atrium. From the right atrium, that blood flows to the right ventricle through what's called the tricuspid, aka the right atrioventricular valve. Remember that all the blood on the right-hand side of the heart is O2 poor, right? It's deoxygenated or O2 poor. I prefer the term O2 poor because blood is never really deoxygenated. It carries an oxygen reserve. Now, we know this is the right-hand side of the heart and the right ventricle because it has a thinner myocardial wall and it doesn't rest above the apex. Right ventricle goes into systole, tricuspid valve shuts, pulmonary semilunar valve opens, blood's forced up into the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries. Remember, the pulmonary arteries are blue because they're carrying O2 poor blood but they're considered arteries because they're carrying blood away from the heart, so don't get that confused on the exam. That blood then gets to the pulmonary capillaries where there's exchange. We get rid of carbon dioxide, pick up oxygen, and that O2 rich blood is then returned back to the heart via the pulmonary veins. And remember, the pulmonary veins are red because they're carrying O2 rich blood, but their veins because they're carrying blood back to the heart. The oxygenation status of the blood doesn't dictate whether it's an artery or vein. It's the histological characteristics and the direction of the blood flow that dictate an artery and a vein. Some people will get that confused on the exam. So the pulmonary veins then return that O2 rich blood back to the left atrium. From the left atrium, that blood moves through the bicuspid, aka left atrioventricular, aka mitral valve, to the left ventricle. Left ventricle goes into systole, right? Mitral valve, aka bic or pardon me, uh, bicuspid valve snaps shut, aortic semilunar valve opens, that blood, O2 rich blood, is pumped up into the aorta, into the systemic circulation, and it begins again. So you're definitely going to get a question asking you to just trace the flow of blood through the heart. And I want to highlight a few points that were really brought up in the uh, This isn't lecture. the craziest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Atria. Apparently a total heart Atria, still beats after you cut it out of its body. So in the previous lecture, we had talked about the conduction pathways and how the electrical rhythms of the heart are coordinated by autorhythmic cells, and those ultimately dictate the mechanical rhythms of the heart, the contraction. So before you have contraction, you always have excitation, meaning you have action potentials, right, collectively referred to as the cardiac impulse spreading through these tissues, and it's those action potentials that trigger contraction. Because we have our SA and AV node in it, those action potentials are coordinated very tightly, you get contraction of the atria prior to contraction of the ventricles. And remember, the ability of the heart to initiate contraction is inherent or intrinsic to the heart itself. It doesn't need the nervous system to tell it to contract. So what you're looking at here is that kind of intrinsic ability of the heart to initiate contraction. That heart's been removed from the body, right? And it will continue to beat as long as there are ATP reserves there, which will just be a few minutes for a turtle's heart. But, right, same thing would happen in a human. So in the previous lecture, we beat excitation to death. What's happening at the level of the action potential? And we um, talked about autorhythmic cells. So the SA node is the pacemaker. 
It rhythmically depolarizes and repolarizes faster than any of the other autorhythmic cell or contractile cardiac muscle tissue, and therefore it establishes the rhythm of the heart, and that's why we call it the pacemaker. That electrical current will sweep through the atria. The atria will depolarize and they will subsequently contract. As that electrical current sweeps through the atria, what it's doing is it's sweeping through contractile cardiac muscle tissue. The reason that contractile cardiac muscle tissue can fire action potentials in response to autorhythmic cells firing action potentials is because they're connected via these things called intercalated discs. Those gap junctions allow electrical communication between the autorhythmic cells and the contractile cardiac muscle cells, right? The contractile cardiac muscle cells, after they fire an action potential, will subsequently contract. That's called excitation contraction coupling. That's what we're going to be going over today. So when the contractile cardiac muscle of the atria, right, depolarizes, so those contractile cells depolarize, they will subsequently contract. And they're given time to contract and top off the ventricles because you have this atrioventricular node. That AV node delays that electrical signal for about 0.1 seconds in order to give the atria time to finish contracting. The atria contract and they don't fill the ventricles up, they top the ventricles off, right? The ventricles are undergoing what's called passive filling. The residual pressure gradient from the heartbeat previous to the passive filling is what actually powers or allows that pressure to um, force blood into the ventricle so the ventricle fills passively. So when you're looking at this, most of the ventricle fills when the heart's not doing anything, when it's neither contracting, it's in a diastolic state, it's relaxing, and those ventricles are just filling up. That's called passive ventricular filling. Now, after the atria finish systole, right, and they move blood down into the ventricles, the electrical signal is allowed to spread to the bundle of His, to the left and right bundle branches, up the Purkinje fibers. As that electrical signal spreads up the Purkinje fibers, it triggers all of those contractile cardiac muscle cells in the ventricle to depolarize. Once depolarization happens, or you get the firing of an action potential in those contractile cardiac muscle cells, that's followed by contraction. So first you get ventricular depolarization, then you get ventricular contraction because the electrical event will always precede the mechanical event in either skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle, right? When the ventricles contract, you'll see that the tricuspid and bicuspid valves snap shut and eventually the pulmonary semilunar and aortic semilunar valves will open and the left and the right side of the heart will move blood into their respective circuits. So... In order to understand excitation contraction coupling and some of the factors that make it so important, it's kind of important to understand the basic structure of either skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. So this is emphasizing skeletal muscle, but there are a lot of parallels between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So we're going to do a little bit of an anatomical review just so everybody's on the same page. So when you look up here, a special name for the plasma membrane of any muscle fiber is called the sarcolemma. So the plasma membrane of cardiac muscle fibers is called the sarcolemma. And remember, that's where those voltage-gated channels that allow for the propagation of an action potential exist. Now, the most important organelle within either a skeletal muscle fiber or a cardiac muscle fiber are these long cylindrical organelles that extend the entire length of the cell called myofibrils. Now, wrapped around uh, extensions of the sarcolemma into the cell that allow the action potential to spread from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, these structures indicated by number four here, these invagnations or folds of the sarcolemma that allow an electrical signal to spread from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, are called T-tubules. And then the sacs that surround each myofibril are called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So whereas T-tubules allow the electrical signal to spread from the outside to the inside of the cell, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the terminal cisternae, right, which is just the end of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that butts up against the T-tubule, store and release calcium. When an action potential travels down the T-tubule, that will trigger the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. And calcium is absolutely necessary for muscle contraction. 
cardiac or skeletal. We'll focus on cardiac. You cannot have cardiac muscle contraction without calcium. So the job of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is very important. Now, when you take these myofibrils and chop them into their functional units, the functional unit, and we're looking at a magnification of like 40,000 right now. We're looking at very small stuff, right? Myofibrils can be broken into functional units called sarcomeres. And sarcomeres consist of both what are called thick and thin filaments. So I'm going to come back here for a minute. They consist of what are called thick and thin filaments. So a sarcomere extends from Z-disc to Z-disc, and projecting directly off the Z-disc, this thin filament, which is made of actin, is called the thin filament, right? So those lighter filaments are called thin filaments. And then there's a protein structure in the middle of each sarcomere called an M-line, and projecting off of those M-lines are the structures indicated by number nine here, which are your thick filaments. So you have your thin filaments, and you have your thick filaments. And notice that the thin and thin, thin and thick filaments overlap one another. Now, spreading through the entirety of the muscle fiber is the largest protein in mammalian systems. It's called Titan. Titan gives all muscle, right, whether you're talking about skeletal or cardiac muscle, um, what's called elasticity and extensibility. So, both cardiac and skeletal muscle can stretch a little bit, and there will be a little bit of recoil after they stretch. It functions almost like a little molecular spring. It's really, really important. A lot of diseases of the heart ultimately boil down to what's going on with Titan. So that kind of springy-looking protein you see running through, it's called Titan because it's the largest protein in mammalian systems. Now, when you look at thin filaments really closely, they're made of repeating units of a protein that latches together called actin. Covering that actin is what's called troponin and tropomyosin. The job of troponin is to bind to calcium. So when calcium levels elevate in the cell, that calcium binds to troponin. And what it does is it shifts this tropomyosin out of the way, exposing what are called myosin binding sites on actin. In other words, the more calcium you have, the more calcium is bound to troponin, the more tropomyosin is shifted out of the way, and the more myosin binding sites on actin are exposed. Over here, we see the myosin protein in these myosin heads at the very tip, and those myosin heads bind to the myosin binding sites on actin during muscle contraction, which is what we're about to go over. We're about to review the contraction cycle so you understand the link between calcium and inotropic forces in the heart, how much force the heart contracts with. Why is calcium so important? So there's your myosin and then your myosin head. So this is a review from AMP1, but we're going to do it because the mechanism of contraction for cardiac muscle tissue is the same as skeletal muscle tissue, and it's important to understand it to understand why some of these things are so critical, some of these different chemical components like ATP, calcium, etc. So <clears throat> at the very beginning of the contraction cycle, imagine your M-line being in the middle here and your Z-disc being over here. The beginning of the contraction cycle, right, these myosin heads have broken down ATP and they've used the energy in that ATP to cock back. That's one of the things that cardiac muscle uses ATP for. Remember, it's like 40% by mass mitochondria. So cardiac muscle cells use a lot of ATP. And one of the reasons they use ATP is to what's called cock the myosin head, right, in preparation for the power stroke. So you have your thin filament made up of actin and then the regulatory proteins, troponin and tropomyosin. When the muscle's at rest, these myosin heads exist in a cocked configuration. So they break down ATP and the energy is used to cock them back almost like the hammer on a gun. Now these little purple balls represent calcium. So if calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin shifts out of the way, allowing myosin to bind to actin. The binding of myosin to actin is called the formation of a cross bridge. The more calcium you have in a cell, the more calcium is bound to troponin and the more cross bridges form and view every myosin head bound to an actin molecule like somebody on a rope. The more people you put on a rope, 
the more force you're going to be able to generate. So more calcium, more troponin bound to calcium, more tropomyosin shifted out of the way, more myosin bound to actin, more myosin able to generate contractile force. So the moment that myosin binds to actin, that's called the formation of a cross bridge and it's followed immediately, like split seconds, right? Split second by what's called the power stroke. The myosin head pulls the actin and it pulls the thin filament closer toward the M line. The Z discs get closer together and that's what produces skeletal muscle contraction and cardiac muscle contraction is the shortening of the sarcomere as a consequence of the thick filament pulling the thin filament toward the M line. In order to restart the cycle again, you need ATP. Myosin will only detach from actin in the presence of ATP, so that ATP binds, it's hydrolyzed, right, cocks the myosin head back, and there we go again. Now, we're not going to talk about rigor mortis because we're focusing on the heart for the moment. So when you think of contraction of a sarcomere in either cardiac or skeletal muscle tissue, if you look at a non-contracted sarcomere, you get these bands. The I band, right, you have the Z disc, the Z disc, and then you have the thin filaments. And the A band is made up of the overlap of thick and thin filaments. And then the H zone is just thick filaments. And notice that there's areas of just thick filaments, just thin filaments, and then overlap. What happens when cardiac or skeletal muscle contracts is myosin binds to actin. So these myosin heads, which are part of the thick filament, bind to actin, which is part of the thin filament, and they move right, the thin filament closer toward the M line, so they tug it in, they go whoop, and move it closer toward that M line. So when you look at a contracted sarcomere, the I band essentially disappears because now there is no just thin filament or it gets much smaller because those thin filaments have put, been pulled closer toward the M line by the thick filaments and the entire sarcomere from Z disc to Z disc gets shorter when millions upon millions of sarcomeres simultaneously get shorter, that is a muscle contraction in either skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. So having a little bit of a review of the idea of the sarcomere is important. Anytime you see striations in a muscle tissue, it means that it's made up of repeating units of sarcomeres. And one of the defining characteristics of cardiac muscle tissue is you see those stripes or striations. Those sarcomeres, right, and that's pretty much what cardiac and skeletal muscle are made out of, are the contractile units. They're what's physically contracting. Thick filament binds to thin filament, pulls it closer toward the M line, Z disc move closer together, muscle contracts, and generates force. When millions and millions of those sarcomeres work simultaneously, you get either a skeletal muscle contraction or a cardiac muscle contraction. So we're going to watch this animation and we're going to just review this again so you understand why calcium is so important. So here would be your thick filament and view the M line as being over here on this side. Here would be your uh, thin filament right here and view the Z disc as being over here on this side. So you have your thick filament and your thin filament. Z discs are over here, right, over on the lateral edges, and then the M line is in the middle, and we're pulling those Z discs closer toward the M line. With calcium elevated around the myofibrils, myosin binding sites on actin are exposed, allowing interaction of the myosin cross bridges with actin. Release of the myosin cross bridge from actin requires binding of ATP. After ATP binds, it is split to ATP. So in order to initiate another contraction cycle, you need to relax the muscle first, right? Whether it be cardiac or skeletal muscle. So the binding of ATP to myosin allows myosin to detach from these, right? Those little depressions, which are myosin binding sites on actin. So you need ATP to relax the muscle as well as contract the muscle. So that ATP binds, myosin detaches, and then myosin is going to break down that ATP and it's going to use the energy to cock the myosin head. DP and inorganic phosphate. The energy derived from this reaction is utilized to cock the cross bridge in preparation for the power stroke. 
The power stroke is initiated. Moment that myosin binds to actin. Thick filament binds to thin filament. Myosin binds to actin. That's called the formation of a cross bridge. Subsequently followed by... When the by myosin cross bridge binds to actin. power stroke. Thin filaments move closer toward the M line. Z discs get closer together. The entire sarcomere gets shorter. Contraction occurs. <clears throat> The cycle begins anew when another ATP binds to myosin. At rest, most cross bridges are in the cocked configuration, prepared to interact with actin when the tropomyosin-troponin complex is moved away from myosin binding sites on actin by calcium ions. So the most gigantic calcium ions in the world, right, bind to troponin. Those red balls represent calcium. That calcium binds to troponin, and it shifts tropomyosin out of the way, so myosin can bind to actin. Myosin binds to actin. That's called the formation of a cross bridge, which is followed by the power stroke. The power stroke is what produces muscle contraction. Every one of these myosin, right, that form a point of attachment to that actin, produce force, just like every human on a, a tug-of-war rope is going to produce force. So the more humans you have on that tug-of-war rope, the more force you're going to produce. The more myosin-actin interactions, the more force you're going to produce. You have to have calcium present in order for a muscle contraction to occur, right? If calcium isn't present, myosin can't bind to actin. The more calcium that's available in the cell, the more calcium's bound to troponin, the more right, tropomyosin shifts out of the way, and the more myosin binds to actin. So there's a direct correlation between the amount of calcium in a cell and the contractile force. Bottom line is anything that increases the amount of available calcium in the cell will increase contractile force. Anything that decreases the amount of available calcium in the cell will decrease contractile force. And remember, an increase in the contractile force of the heart is called a positive inotropic effect, and a decrease in the contractile force of the heart is called a negative inotropic effect. All the drugs that influence the inotropy of the heart, the, um, the, the, the um, contractile force with which the heart beats, influence calcium levels, right? Because there's that direct correlation. So now I feel like we have the background necessary to talk about excitation, contraction, coupling, and cardiac muscle tissue. And the bottom line is, is it begins with the firing of an action potential. That's why it's called excitation contraction. The stimulus for an action potential in a cardiac muscle fiber is its neighbor firing an action potential that ultimately originates at the autorhythmic cells in the SA node, or the pacemaker cells. So neighbor fires an action potential, we get the firing of an action potential. This is where you would get that action potential with that prolonged um, plateau phase, right? And those voltage-gated sodium channels, calcium channels, potassium channels are located in the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the cardiac muscle cell. So action potential spreads down T-tubule. In the T-tubules of cardiac muscle cells, right, which allow the electrical signal to spread from the outside to the inside of the cell, you have what are called L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. These L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, as the action potential hits them, open. It activates them. And that allows calcium from the extracellular fluid from outside the cell to rush inside the cell. That calcium rushing inside the cell will then bind to what's called a ryanidine receptor. The calcium binds to the ryanidine receptor in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it causes that ryanidine receptor to open. When calcium binds to the ryanidine receptor and it causes it to open, that allows the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release more calcium. That process in which calcium binds to a ryanidine receptor, causing the ryanidine receptor to physically open, allowing more calcium into the cardiac muscle cell is called a calcium-induced calcium spark because it's calcium that induces an even larger calcium spark. 
what physically binds to the ryanidine receptor and allows it to open is calcium. So it's calcium triggering the release of more calcium, and that's what the calcium-induced calcium spark is. Calcium then binds to troponin, which shifts tropomyosin, allowing myosin to bind to actin. When myosin binds to actin, it pulls actin closer toward the thick, thick filament, pulls the thin filament closer toward the M line. The Z disc get closer together, the sarcomere gets shorter, and contraction occurs. The more calcium you have, the more contractile force the cell will contract with, in this case, the cardiac muscle cells. The less calcium you have, the less contractile force the cardiac muscle cell will contract with. Explain to me why. Why does that calcium matter? Binds to troponin, shifts tropomyosin, allows myosin to bind to actin. More calcium means more myosin bound to actin. Now, after contraction happens, relaxation has to happen. So calcium then detaches, right, from troponin, and it gets sucked back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum using what's called a calcium ATPase, or a circa pump. This calcium pump is hugely energy intensive. It's one of the most important energy users within cardiac muscle cells. That's why you see that ATP there. That is a primary active transport process occurring. So we use ATP to detach myosin from actin and to cock the myosin head in preparation for the power stroke. We also use ATP to suck calcium out of the cell when the cell is relaxing. Now, not all the calcium moves into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Some of that calcium is pumped back out of the cell in order to facilitate this calcium-induced calcium spark. It's done, that's achieved with what's called the sodium-calcium exchanger. The sodium-calcium exchanger uses the energy from the electrochemical gradient with respect to sodium to right, fuel the process of moving calcium back out of the cell against its concentration gradient. Whenever you get the movement of sodium coupled to the movement of another ion, that's a secondary active transport process. All of this is made possible, the action potential, the movement of calcium, etc., by what's called the sodium-potassium pump, right? So the sodium-potassium pump, three sodium ions out, two potassium ions in. It's what allows the action potential to occur in the first place. Also what allows this process, which pulls calcium back out of the cell, to be used here for. So let's go ahead and watch this. This animation sequence will provide an overview of normal cardiac structure and physiology, along with a review of the process of excitation-contraction coupling in the heart. The myocardium is comprised of cardiac myocyte and non-myocyte cells. Cardiac myocytes make up approximately 70% of the mass of the heart and are enmeshed in a collagen network that acts as a supporting framework. Blood is supplied to individual cardiac myocytes through capillaries that are in close proximity to them. Cardiac myocytes are comprised of actin and myosin myofilaments, whose organization gives rise to the characteristic striated appearance of cardiac muscle. There are two prominent organelles within cardiac myocytes, the mitochondria, which produce energy, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which regulates calcium handling in the cell. Cardiac contraction is initiated when extracellular calcium moves into the cell across the voltage-dependent L-type calcium channel. The calcium that enters the cell triggers calcium release from the reanidine receptor through a process known as calcium-triggered calcium release. Calcium that is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum binds to the actin thin filaments, thereby initiating contraction of the sarcomeres. At the end of the contraction sequence, calcium comes off of the myofilaments and is actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by the calcium pump in its membrane. Calcium is also transported out of the cell into the extracellular space by a membrane-bound pump sodium-calcium exchanger, which is not shown here. Cardiac contraction is brought about by interactions between the actin-thin filament, shown in yellow and purple, and the myosin crossbridges that project from the thick filament, shown in red. In relaxed cardiac muscle, the conformation of troponin and tropomyosin prevents actin from interacting with the myosin crossbridges. As a result, actin is unable to interact with the myosin crossbridges containing bound ATP. 
In activated cardiac muscle, calcium binds to troponin C, which then shifts troponin complexes and tropomyosin to an active conformation that enables actin to interact with the myosin crossbridges. Myosin ATPase on the myosin heads then hydrolyzes ATP, thus providing the requisite energy for the myosin crossbridge to interact with the thin filaments and pull the thin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere in a ratchet-like fashion. In this sequence of the normal heart, we have reviewed the process of excitation-contraction coupling. As will be discussed subsequently, this process of excitation-contraction coupling becomes dysregulated in cardiac hypertrophy and cardiac failure. So cardiac muscle tissue is ratchet. All right. So when you think about describing the technical functional role of the heart then, what the heart does is it contracts and it generates a pressure gradient that moves blood throughout the body through a system of tubes we call blood vessels. The highest pressure in the system at any given point in time is the left ventricle during ventricular systole. So left ventricle contracts, it generates so much pressure because it has this big, thick myocardial wall, this muscular wall, forces blood up and out into the aorta and then into the systemic circulation. That blood moves through arteries, which take blood away from the heart, and that O2-rich blood moves into capillary networks all throughout the body. Now notice that capillaries have a lower pressure than the left ventricle and arteries, right? In fact, the pressure in the left ventricle is almost the same as the pressure in the arteries during left ventricular, ventricular systole. So when you're measuring pressure in an artery and you say it's systolic pressure, that's the pressure in the artery during ventricular systole, right? Specifically left ventricular systole because they're almost equal to one another. It's a little higher in the ventricle than it is in the artery, but we call it systolic blood pressure because it's reflective of the pressure of blood flowing through arteries while the ventricle is contracting. So the pressure of blood in the left ventricle and the arteries is much higher than the pressure of blood in capillaries because blood flows from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Right? That's how fluids flow. That's how gases move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. MMHG stands for millimeters of mercury. It's a measure of pressure. You see MMHG, you know you're measuring a mechanical event because pressure is a mechanical reflection of a mechanical event. So capillaries have an intermediate pressure. This is where you get the exchange. Oxygen's delivered, carbon dioxide's picked up, and that O2 poor blood is then returned back to the right side of the heart via veins. Notice that veins have a much lower pressure than arteries and then capillaries also. So when you pierce an artery, blood will actually squirt out every time your ventricles contract. When you pierce a vein, like when you get blood drawn, blood kind of oozes out. There isn't those pressure fluctuations in veins. And veins are really, really low pressure systems comparative to arteries, right? So you don't bleed out quite as quickly if you pierce a vein as opposed to if you pierce an artery. And then the lowest pressure in the system is gonna be in the right side of the heart, specifically the right ventricle during ventricular diastole, when the ventricle is relaxing, because blood can only move along the pressure gradient from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. So when you're talking about defining the functional role of the heart from a technical perspective, the contraction and relaxation of the heart produces a pressure gradient that forces blood through the cardiovascular system. The movement of blood through the cardiovascular system is what allows transport to occur in the body. So when you're measuring somebody's blood pressure, and we're not going to be doing this in lab, but I talk about this again when we get into arteries. I just want to tie this to what's happening with the mechanical activity of the heart. You put on this device called a blood pressure cuff. The entire device is called a spigo manometer, a measurement of pressure, a device to measure pressure. So you put in this blood pressure cuff, this inflatable cuff, onto somebody's brachial area, their arm and you start pumping it up. So you go ch -ch 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 -ch. This pump inflates and the pressure gauge is measuring the air pressure inside the pump, or pardon me, inside the cuff, right? Now, this pressure gauge is measuring the air pressure in there and you pump it up really high to like 160 mmHg, which is millimeters of mercury. At 160 millimeters of mercury, 
the pressure in that blood pressure cuff is going to exceed the pressure in the brachial artery during ventricular systole. So that particular right artery, the brachial artery, is just clamped off. It's just completely shut. Then you slowly start letting air out of this inflatable cuff and the pressure starts to drop. When the pressure drops enough for blood during ventricular systole to force its way through that blood pressure cuff, that's the moment that that happens. You'll see the needle start to jump. That means the pressure during ventricular systole is greater than the pressure in the blood pressure cuff. You can hear that with what are called the sounds of quart cough. You can actually hear boop, boop, boop if you're listening to the artery with a um, stethoscope. And those are called the sounds of quart cough. At the first sound of quart cough, the moment that blood can, uh, the pressure of the blood in the artery exceeds the pressure of the blood in the cuff and it starts to push through, that is called your systolic blood pressure. And that's the first measurement you take when you're measuring somebody's blood pressure. You continue to let air out of the cuff and eventually, right, the pressure in the cuff will be lower than the pressure of the blood in the artery during both ventricular systole and ventricular diastole. The needle will stop jumping, and you call that diastolic blood pressure, which is the pressure in arteries during ventricular diastole. So arteries, as you're going to learn when you get into blood vessels, are really elastic because they have to cope with these major pressure fluctuations. But you'll hear me use terms like mean arterial pressure, which again is discussed in... Uh, the unit over blood vessels, but I'm going to introduce it now because we're going to talk about it in lab. So when I say MAP, M-A-P, I'm talking about mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure is the average pressure in the arteries in your body at any given point in time, and it's calculated using a formula. So when you're calculating mean arterial pressure, one of the values that's important here is what's called the pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. So if your blood pressure is 120 over 80, your pulse pressure would be 40, 120 subtract 80. So that's an easy one. Now in the mean arterial pressure, it's diastolic plus one-third multiplied by systolic minus diastolic. So in this case, these two don't correlate. Let's say your diastolic was 73 and your systolic was 115. You would calculate pulse pressure like this. That would give you 87 mmHg. Your, or pardon me, your pulse pressure would be the difference between these two, but the mean arterial pressure would be all of this together, right? And it's pretty easy. You'd Multiply one-third by 42, you get 14, you add it to the diastolic pressure, and that's the mean arterial pressure, which is the average pressure in your arteries at any given point in time. Why do we care about blood pressure? Well, we've discussed this in a previous section, but I'm just going to highlight this again. We care about blood pressure because blood vessels are subject to damage. And when you develop higher than normal blood pressure, that can put stress on your blood vessels. So an average blood pressure in an American, and this is a debatable value, is 120 systolic over 80 diastolic. That's normal blood pressure. Anything below that, you're just maintaining your healthy lifestyle. Now, you have these values of prehypertension, stage 1, stage 2 hypertension, and then there are different clinical paths you should take, like what you should do. But the bottom line is why is high blood pressure so dangerous? Why do we care about it so much as clinicians? If somebody's blood pressure is perpetually elevated, it means, one, that blood vessels are being ripped apart. So every time you get this systolic of 160, that means there is pressure, more pressure being put on the blood vessels, and that can rip it apart internally, eventually exposing things like collagen fibers, which can predispose you to the formation of plaques. It can also right, predispose you to the activation of the intrinsic clotting pathway, and it can trigger a blood clot. That blood clot can result in a DVT, a heart attack, or a stroke, right? So that blood clot can form in one of the blood vessels in your heart. There you have a heart attack, or it'll produce cardiac ischemia and eventually produce a heart attack or result in a heart attack. With a stroke, blood clot forms in one of the blood vessels of the brain, not getting blood to the brain. It's going to produce all sorts of problems. So we care about hypertension because it predisposes you to blood clots. 
seemingly paradoxically, meaning it's kind of weird that it would do this as well, but high blood pressure also predisposes you to aneurysms. Aneurysms are just when blood vessels burst open. So it's not just clots we worry about, it's aneurysms. Like if your blood pressure is over 160, you're systolic, and you go into like a, a dental hygiene appointment, your hygienist isn't allowed to work on you legally because the flossing of your gums will produce severe bleeding just because there's so much pressure forcing that blood out of those blood vessels, even if you just nick them. So hypertension is nothing to play around with. It is a super serious condition. I mention this in the context of talking about the mechanical activity of the heart because a lot of drugs used to treat things like hypertension target the heart, right? And they target the inotropic effects of the heart, meaning the contractile force with which the heart beats. Sometimes you can decrease that through the use of medications. Or if you're suffering from heart failure, on the other hand, you want to increase that through the use of medications. So. When you look at this, we're on slide 8, and you're probably on the follow-along slide 8 to slide 10. I want you to really look at what's happening here. So in the very top image that's indicated by number 1 on this, the entire heart is in diastole. When the entire heart's in diastole, blood's returning back to both the right and the left side of the heart via the different veins that bring that blood back. Everything works along a pressure gradient. So when the pressure in the atria is higher than the pressure in the ventricles, the tricuspid and bicuspid valve is going to be open, and the ventricles are going to passively be filling. Notice there is no contraction going on right now. The ventricles are just passively filling, and that's what fills up 85 to 90% of the volume of the ventricles. The entire heart's in diastole, the entire heart's relaxed, and the residual pressure moving blood through the cardiovascular system right, produces a situation in which the pressure in the atria is higher than the pressure in the ventricles, and therefore the tricuspid and bicuspid valve are open. Now, that ventricular filling is comes to a crescendo at the very end when it's like 90% full, right? The ventricles are like 90% full. The atria, both the right and the left, will whoop, contract. They'll go into atrial systole. They'll contract from base to apex, and they'll top the ventricles off. During atrial systole, the pressure in the atria is definitely higher than the pressure in the ventricles, so the tricuspid and bicuspid valve are open. Now, the ventricles go into diastole, the electrical signals allowed into the ventricles, and the ventricles depolarize. After the ventricles depolarize, they will contract. So the ventricles will contract, and the moment the ventricles begin contracting, the atrioventricular valves, aka the AV valves, will snap shut. So the atrioventricular valves will snap shut. The snapping shut of the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve, collectively referred to as the atrioventricular because it regulates the movement from the atria into the ventricles, the snapping shut of the tricuspid and bicuspid valve makes a sound, right? The acoustics of the blood snapping those valves shut make a sound. That first heart sound is called your lub. It's what it's actually called in like medical textbooks, lub. So that's heart sound number one. It's the result of the tricuspid and bicuspid, a.k.a. your atrioventricular valves, snapping shut. Now, at the very beginning of when the ventricles just get done with diastole and they shift into systole, notice that the ventricles are full. So at the very end of ventricular diastole, right, after they top off, when the ventricles are as full as they're ever going to be with blood, we call that volume end diastolic volume. Right after the ventricles finish being in diastole, they go into systole, the valves snap shut, and we start pushing blood up toward the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves, but those have a lot of pressure necessary to open them up. The pressure in the ventricle has to exceed the pressure in either the pulmonary trunk or the aorta, but those pressures are pretty high. So it takes a little while to pop 
the pulmonary semilunar valves and aortic valves open. So while the ventricle is contracting and pressure is building up, but no blood is moving, we call that isovolumetric contraction. So ventricular systole begins, the ventricles are full of blood, they're pushing on those valves, but the pressure in the pulmonary trunk and the aorta are higher than the pressure in the ventricles. So those valves remain shut. Right? So you got to build up pressure to physically pop them open. While that's happening, you're at what's called end diastolic volume. That's the actual volume of blood in the ventricles. The ventricles are full of blood. Then once the pressure in the ventricle exceeds the pressure in the pulmonary trunk in the aorta, you force those semilunar valves open, the pulmonary, the aortic semilunar valves, and blood starts moving into the respective circuits, be it the pulmonary or systemic circuits, so that blood starts moving. That's called the ejection phase. So blood's going to be moving out, and the volume in the ventricle is going to be decreasing, 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 because you're squeezing all that blood out. Eventually, the ventricles are going to get to what's called the end of systole, when the ventricles are done with their systole, meaning they finished contracting, they've contracted and forced all their blood out, right, or a mo as much as blood out as they're going to force, the end of ventricular systole produces a volume called end systolic volume. If you take end diastolic volume, let's say it's 150 milliliters, and subtract it from end systolic volume, let's say that's 70 milliliters, that gives you what's called your stroke volume. Your stroke volume is the amount of blood that's moved with every heartbeat, right? So in this case, it would be 80 milliliters, meaning every time your heart beats, moves about 80 milliliters of blood. That's not a, that's a you know an average amount, a standard amount, right? It varies depending on the size of the person and their heart, but that's how you would calculate it. You take end diastolic volume, subtract end systolic volume. In other words, you take the ventricles when they're full, subtract them from the volume of the ventricles when they're empty, and you get your stroke volume, the amount of blood that's moved every time the heart beats. Now, as the ventricles start relaxing, right, the pressure in the ventricles is less than the pressure in the pulmonary and artery and the pulmonary trunk in the aorta. So when the pressure in the pulmonary trunk in the aorta exceeds the pressure in the ventricles, the semilunar valves snap shut. When the semilunar valves snap shut, that produces your second heart sound, which is the dub. Then the ventricles are going to continue relaxing, but for a while during that relaxation phase, the pressure in the ventricles is still higher than the pressure in the atria, so the tricuspid and bicuspid valve remain shut. This is called isovolumetric relaxation, and that will continue to occur, this isovolumetric relaxation. By the way, any isovolumetric period, no blood is moving. All your valves are closed. So during isovolumetric relaxation, all the valves are closed and the pressure in the ventricles is decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. When the heart is entirely relaxed, eventually the pressure in the ventricles will get lower than the pressure in the atria. The bicuspid and tricuspid valve will open again, so tri on the right, bi on the left. And you will start with passive ventricular filling, and that's the beginning of a new cardiac cycle. So that's what you're looking at with an individual heartbeat. One of the important things to take away from this is how to calculate stroke volume and what accounts for the different lub dub of the heart. So when you're looking at this and you're looking at when these are open and when these are closed, right? When the ventricles go into systole, the atrioventricular valves snap shut. The snapping shut of the atrioventricular valves produces your first heart sound, which is the lub. Every single valve actually produces its own unique sound, but we hear them because it happens simultaneously as kind of one sound, the lub, unless you're specifically listening. Right? Then when the ventricles go into diastole and they start relaxing, eventually the pressure in the atria exceeds the pressure in the ventricles. Right? Well, well let me go back here. So eventually when the ventricles are contracting, you're going to snap shut the atrioventricular valves. You're going to open up the semilunar valves. Then the ventricles start to relax. The semilunar valves will close. That's what produces your dub. 
after the dub, you can assume that the um, tricuspid and bicuspid, the atrioventricular valves, will open again, and the entire heart is in diastole. So the lub results from the closing of the atrioventricular valves, right? During the time period between the lub and the dub, the ventricles are in systole. And then at the dub, that's the closing of the semilunar valves, you can assume after the dub, the ventricles are in diastole until you hear the next lub. So between the lub-dub, ventricles have to be in systole. Between the dub and the next lub, the ventricles have to be in diastole. Now, when you are a nursing student and you're auscultating or listening right to the heart to evaluate whether you have a heart murmur or for the presence of a heart murmur, which is really just a problem with a valve, you're going to be grilled very closely on where are you actually listening to each of the different valves in the heart, right? So this just gives you a breakdown of that, and I'm not going to say if you were listening between the fifth intercostal space and the midclavicular line, you'd be listening to blank. But what I do expect you to understand is what a murmur is and the difference between a systolic and a diastolic murmur. We're actually going to listen to some heart sounds, too, while we're at it. So action potential spreads begins in the SA node. It spreads throughout the atria. The depolarization of the atria is followed by contraction. Now notice in the beginning here, when the entire heart's in diastole, the ventricles are just passively filling. Then the cardiac cycle begins. The SA node fires an action potential. That cardiac impulse spreads throughout the atria. The atria depolarize and then contract. While the atria are contracting, the pressure in the atria is definitely higher than the pressure in the ventricles. So the atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid and the bicuspid, are open while the atria are in systole. Now, while the atria are in systole, this AV node delays that signal for about 0.1 seconds. Then it allows the signal to spread to the bundle of hiss, the left and right bundle branches, up the Purkinje fibers. As that electrical signal sweeps up the Purkinje fibers, the ventricles depolarize, which is an electrical event, and then they subsequently contract, which is a mechanical event. Right when the ventricles begin to contract, the atrioventricular valves snap shut, bloop, bloop, and they kind of snap shut simultaneously. As they snap shut simultaneously, the actual physical closing and the backflow of blood against those valves snapping shut produces the lub. That's your first heart sound. So when you're looking at here, what you're looking at is an acoustic pattern. You're looking at sounds. You're looking at acoustic data. There's your lub. Then the ventricles take a little bit of pressure to pop open the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves. Eventually they open, and while the ventricles are in systole, they're ejecting blood right into the different circuits. When the ventricles go into diastole, the pressure in the pulmonary trunk and the aorta exceed the pressure in the ventricles, so the semilunar valves, the pulmonary and aortic valves, snap shut. The snapping shut of the pulmonary semilunar and aortic semilunar valves produces your second heart sound, which is the dub. So between your lub and your dub, you can assume that the ventricles are in systole, right? Because we know that mechanically, the atrioventricular valves have snapped shut and the semilunar valves have likely opened up. So that's your first, right, and your second heart sound. Between your first and your second, you can assume ventricular systole. So after the lub, ventricles are in systole. Then after the dub, the moment that you hear the dub, you assume the ventricles are in diastole because the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves have closed, meaning that the pressure in these blood vessels is greater than the pressure in the ventricles, and they snap shut. From your dub to your next lub, you assume that the ventricles are in diastole. A heart murmur results from problems with valves, right? So valves are there to ensure the unidirectional flow or the one-way flow of blood through the heart. A heart murmur is a problem with a valve. And there are essentially two classifications of heart murmurs. There's stenotic or stenosis heart murmurs. Stenosis 
results when a valve isn't opening up enough, right? So if a valve isn't opening all the way because it's calcified or something like that, it's only going to open a little bit of the way and it's going to occlude or kind of close off the opening between one chamber and another, or one chamber and a vessel, right? When that happens, if you've ever put your, imagine a stenosis, imagine you have a hose and there's water flowing through it and then you put your thumb at the end of that hose, right? Well, when you put your thumb at the end of that hose, it increases the water pressure, so that water starts kind of flying out. Even though there's less water, it flies out with higher pressure. That's how you can like change how far your water is being sprayed out of your hose. Well, the same thing happens here. If you're not opening up your valves enough, right? So the valves aren't opening enough, like let's say the aortic semilunar valve, well, the ventricles in systole, this aortic semilunar valve doesn't open enough. It's going to force blood out at a really high pressure, and that's going to change the acoustics of the heart, and you're going to hear it almost like a whoosh, whoosh, right between your lub dub. And we're going to listen to those things in just a moment. Any murmur that happens between the lub and the dub is a systolic murmur. Another type of murmur is what's called regurgitation. Regurgitation is when one of these valves, let's say like the bicuspid aka the left atrioventricular aka the mitral valve, let's say that this guy starts swinging back in the other direction, right? It doesn't close all the way. So the actual valve itself swings back in the other direction. Well, as the ventricle is contracting, some of that blood is going to be forced back from the left ventricle into the left atrium. That's called regurgitation. And when you listen to regurgitation, it sounds like boom, 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 because you're actually getting this kind of regurgitant flow of blood back into here, which sounds almost like a bubbling. So either the valve isn't opening enough, right? That's stenosis, or it's swinging back in the opposite direction and allowing blood to go in the wrong direction. That's regurgitation. Those are the two types of heart murmurs you have. Now, one of the things I want to show you here is heart sounds. So here's a normal heart sound. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Right? That's a normal heart sound. That's a great heart sound. Now when we look at murmurs, a Aortic stenosis. I'm not going to ask you to diagnose a murmur, but I expect you to know what murmurs are. So you're listening to the heart, and you're listening at the aortic semilunar valve, right? And listen to the difference if you can hear it. Because that aortic valve isn't opening enough, and that blood is just going, trying to get through, just like that kind of example I gave you with the hose. So it's kind of fun to listen to all the different um, heart sounds and heart murmurs. Again, I wouldn't ask you to diagnose a heart murmur, but, um, you know, just interesting. So that leads us to our final concept today, which is what's called the pressure volume loop. And the pressure volume loop will be easier to understand given the context of what we've just covered. So when you look at a pressure volume loop, it is a graph that measures left ventricular pressure or right, doesn't matter, right? But now it's telling us left ventricular pressure in millimeters of mercury. Measurements of pressure are mechanical measurements. They're measuring a mechanical event. And we're looking at how pressure changes in the left ventricle. How does volume change? So we're thinking about the flow of fluid on the X, right, axis. So pressure as a function of fluid flow. As fluid flow changes, what happens to pressure? As pressure changes, what happens to fluid flow? And this is called the pressure volume loop. It's used in diagnostics all the time. So let's go to the very beginning here and tie what's happening on this graph to the mechanical activity of the heart. Right now, the entire heart's in diastole, so the pressure is very low. We'd be at the point D right here. Pressure is very low. So entire heart's in diastole. The moment that the pressure in the aorta exceeds the pressure in the ventricles, in this case we're talking about the left side of the heart, Right, so the moment that the pressure in the atrium, sorry, 
exceeds the pressure in the ventricles, the atrioventricular valve will open. So the entire heart's in diastole. The moment the atrioventricular valve opens, blood starts flowing into the ventricle, and you'll see that while the pressure of the ventricle is really low, the ventricle is filling up. This is called passive filling. 90% of this happens while the entire heart's in diastole. Now, toward the end, the atria will contract, and you'll get this little pressure spike, and they will top the ventricle off. So this entire time, the ventricle's in diastole from D, which is the moment that the mitral valve, a.k.a. the bicuspid, a.k.a. the left atrioventricular valve opens, all the way to A, the ventricles are in diastole, right? And what's happening here is the ventricles are filling up. When the ventricle's at its most full, about 120 milliliters here, we refer to that, that point indicated by A, right, which is the beginning of ventricular systole. At the very end of ventricular diastole, we call that our end diastolic volume, when the ventricle is as full as blood as it's ever going to be. Then at A, you get contraction of the ventricles. As the ventricles contract, right, the pressure starts to increase. Now, the moment the ventricles start to contract, the atrioventricular valves, right, the bicuspid, aka mitral valve, snap shut, right? Same thing happens on the right side, but we're measuring the left side right now. During any isovolumetric or isovolumic event, all valves are going to be closed. So the other, if valves weren't closed, the volume would be changing. So the moment that the ventricles go into systole, the atrioventricular valve snaps shut, right? And the ventricle's building up pressure. It's full of blood, and it's building up pressure to try and pop open the aortic semilunar valve, right? So that pressure is increasing, 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 increasing. Eventually, that pressure, right, the pressure in the ventricle, exceeds the pressure of the aortic semilunar valve. The aortic semilunar valve opens, right? And the ventricle starts moving blood up and out. As the ventricle moves blood up and out, that's called the ejection phase. So now blood is moving out of the ventricles into the blood vessels, in this case, into the aorta. So the volume in the ventricles is decreasing. So here is the moment that the aortic semilunar valve pops open, right? Then you're ejecting blood, meaning you're pumping blood into the systemic circuit. The peak here would be your systolic blood pressure. Do -do 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 Boom. Right? So ventricles contracting, contracting, contracting. And at the very end of its contraction, right? It's going to be as empty as it's ever going to be. We refer to the volume here at the very end of its contraction as being end systolic. So whereas the end diastolic volume was like 120 milliliters, the end systolic volume was like 50 milliliters. If you take the end diastolic, the ventricle when it's full, and subtract it from the end systolic, the ventricle when it's empty, you get what's called stroke volume which is the volume of blood that's moved by your heart with every heartbeat. In this case, it would be 70 milliliters if we were using this um, pressure volume loop. So the atrioventricular valves, as the ventricles relax, right, uh, are going to remain shut. And then the aortic semilunar valve, as the ventricle relaxes, is going to snap shut. The snapping shut of the semilunar valves that takes place as the ventricles relax, produce, or result in your second heart sound, which is your dub. After the dub to the next lub, right, the ventricles are relaxing, the entire heart's relaxing, and it's called isovolumetric relaxation. So the heart's relaxing, right, the entire heart eventually right toward the beginning of the next cycle, the pressure in the atria will exceed the pressure in the ventricles, and the ventricle will start to fill again, and that is what's called a pressure volume loop. We measure them all the time, especially in places like research settings, because different medications will change 
your pressure volume loop and we want to see how that changes it because it's telling you how much blood you're physically moving through your body with each beat of the heart which allows you to calculate critical cardiac